Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to New Spring Church. We're so glad that you're here today. If you didn't already know, let me fill you in. This weekend, we are celebrating 25 years at the corner of K96 and 21st at this campus. We're celebrating a God who works miracles, and Scripture tells us in Revelation 12, that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That's and right, so today you're right. going to get to hear some testimony as to what God's done to make a way for us to be here in this place today. But I know that he's been faithful in my life. I know he's been faithful in your life. So right now I want to invite you if you can, stand to your feet with us as we testify today to what Christ has done. We're making a declaration. The New Spring Kansas Choir is here to tell you. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus. So come on and lift your voices. today and we have an invitation we're gonna go to our resting place our fortress our place of refuge when we don't know what tomorrow holds we know we can go to the one who holds tomorrow who holds our lives in his hands so would you join me as we call on him today? speak to me when the sun steals my voice you understand me, you understand me. Come to me in the valley of unknowns. You understand me, you understand me, you understand me. Stop. 
Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking Oh yeah I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generation So why would he fail now? He won't See, I've still got joy in chaos. See, I've got peace that makes no sense. And I won't be going under. Cause I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I've built my life on Jesus. Yes, I have. And he Let's do that right now. Let's trust him and sing.
Our God is so great that he has many names. He reaches out to us with them to show us the many facets of his character. He's inviting us to get to know him. So come and meet God. Yeah, our series is called Meet God. And we've been looking at the names of God because there's so many names of God in the Bible. God, God is so awesome that he has to demonstrate his character and his power to us by using different names that focus on and emphasize those aspects of his strength, power, character, and goodness. It is interesting to me, we've only covered two names of God so far, haven't we? We've covered Elohim, which is Genesis 1-1, and then last week we, we looked at El Roy from Genesis 16. By the way, it's interesting to me how many of these names of God are in the book of Genesis. It's almost as if God says right up front, I want you to know who I am. But going back to those first two names, I, I just find it interesting how they juxtapose against each other. Because in Elohim, you have creator, power, majesty, the builder of the universe, the one who wrote the codes for DNA. And by the way, you know, we didn't even know about DNA until Watson and Crick discovered the long molecule in 1958. But God not only knew about it, God built it. And he, he gave us the ability to have trillions of cells that replicate every aspect of our body. That's just majestic. That's Elohim. That's Elohim. But then last week, we saw that he's also El Roy. That the God who is so majestic and so wonderful and awesome that he built the universe and everything that is, is also the God who sees us. That's what El Roy means, the God who sees me. Jesus would take it this maybe a little further and say, he knows the number of hairs on your head, which in my case is getting to be a little bit of an easier job. You might even see a photo or two of me in years past and you're like, that man had more hair at one time. Well, it is interesting to me, as I said, how many of these names are in Genesis. And today we're going to look at another story in the book of Genesis that gives us another name. And again, this particular name is it's not so much a name for God per se. It's a name for what God does. And as I shared with you, this is not a series on prayer necessarily. And yet when you and I get through with this series, our prayer life is going to be dramatically different. For instance, okay, let's just take what we've learned so far and we have a whole lot more to go. Let's just say you've got a huge problem. Hey, you're turning it over to Elohim. Let's just say you feel like you're invisible and you wonder if anybody sees and knows how you feel. He's El Roy. He's the God who sees you. Do you, you see how that affects your prayer life? Because you know, you know you're talking to the God who's so awesome that he built the universe, but you're also talking to the God who knows everything about you. In fact, the psalmist would say he knows when we stand up and sit down. We don't even remember how many times we've done that today, even in church probably. <laughs> well, we're going to look at a third name today, and, and there's a story that goes with this name, but I'm not going to spend too much time with the story. That's for another day. I want us to take a quick look here. Abraham, as we saw last week, has been promised a son. We covered that. And time has passed, and late in life, God gave this promised son, Isaac, to Abraham and Sarah. And again, we really need a long time to discuss this, so I don't want to leave you in the wrong place, but I'm going to do my best to give it to you in just a few sentences. God needed to demonstrate something. He wanted to show the human race how that ultimately he himself was going to have to do something that he never asked anybody else to do. God is not into human sacrifice, but he was going to have to sacrifice his son, Jesus, to save us all. So he wanted to give a, hum a human illustration of this. And the Bible tells us that uh, to give the human race this object lesson, he asked only temporarily a father to go through the motions of being willing to sacrifice his son. And it was Abraham with the promised son, Isaac. He wanted Abraham to be that example. And as they were going out to go to this place where Isaac would never be sacrificed, but as they were going out there, Isaac noticed something peculiar. He had been there to sacrifice with his dad before, and he said, Dad, we've got the wood, we've got the coals, we've got everything we need for sacrifice, but where is the lamb? And that's when Abraham said, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered, and God did. On that mountain, at the moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, don't lay a hand on the boy. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. 
Abraham named the place Yahweh Yireh. Well, there's no J in Hebrew, but there is in our language. And so we call this name for God Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. And here is the quotation that people said to each other and still say, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, Hebrew is a difficult language for me, but it is interesting because sometimes Hebrew has implications that are hard to translate into English. Yes, it means on the mountain of the Lord, God will provide. But what the Hebrew also implies is in the moment of our extremity, God provides. We put it in common language. When we're up against it, when we're going to pieces, when we hit the wall, when we're desperate, God provides. That's probably the best way we can put it in English. When we're desperate, Jehovah Jireh, God provides. Today, I'm going to do something I rarely ever do. I don't ever talk much about New Spring Church. You guys know I don't raise money. Uh, you guys are generous, and because of your generosity, great things are able to happen. I rarely ever talk about the various ministries of New Spring because in the 65 or 70 minutes, we have a lot to talk about, about life change. And I try to keep, I try to keep us on the main road of talking about what we need to hear. What I want to do today, though, because of the day that the week that we're in, this week of celebration, we're experiencing a milestone, 25 years at this location. I want to talk about New Spring Church. On May 23rd, 1999, for the very first time, we met, for those of you here in South Auditorium, we met in this room. It is easy to think about New Spring as it is today, but I want you to understand that the church that had the vision for this, in fact, the church at the old location, the last week we were there, had a little more than 600 people in attendance. Last week, we had over 7,200 here, and so God has clearly grown us and built us. But there's something on my heart. Almost all of you have come in the last 25 years. Only a, a relative handful of us were here from those days. And we're not getting any younger. Uh, the stories, the two stories I'm going to share with you today, I was in my early and mid-30s. I'm not anymore. And I, 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 want, I want you to know what God has done here because I don't want anyone to have the wrong idea. I think about that a lot. You know, I think about all the good things that God has done for us. And I drive around and I see the campus and, of course, the traffic jams that we're all into. And, and here's my fear. My fear is that a lot of people will look at New Spring and say, another mega church. And people have kind of a, a, a presumption, often based in ignorance, but a presumption based on a mega church that basically there's somebody that had a master plan and they, they use this agenda. They use this, um, they use this template. And, and I, here's the thing. If you've been here for very long, you know that's not the case because we're something of an iconoclast. I mean, in the sense that if we can build a bridge to somebody, we're going to build it, but we're not going to vary a centimeter from the word of God. We're going to tell the truth. So consequently, <laughs> we have not built New Spring just telling people what's comfortable to hear. We've, we've, we've got a message of telling people how their lives can eternally change. So I just want to make that point. I mean, people, I think, could look at New Spring and say, oh, these guys had a master plan. They had some kind of strategy. They brought in experts. They followed some device plan. Listen, guys, I'll be here 40 years if God lets me. I'll be here 40 years next June. And I want to tell you something. Nothing can be further from the truth. If you want to know the story of New Spring Church, it's desperation and miracles. Mary Alice is always saying she's going to write a book someday, and the title of her book is, I Had a Front Row Seat for All the Miracles. And so for all of us on the inside, for all of us who've been here for a long time, we're aware of the fact that we didn't do this. There was no plan. There was no template. There was no model. There was no conference that gave us the secret sauce. We get asked that every week because leaders come from all over the country, pastors, pastor staffs come here to our campus, to our facilities during the weekend, and oftentimes they want to ask, what is the secret sauce? And I got to tell you, the secret sauce is depend on the Holy Spirit, love people, preach the word of God. That's the secret. <laughs> so uh, in my years here, I could keep you here, and I won't, I could keep you here for the next um, six hours telling you stories about the miracles that God has done. And that's what old people do. They like to reminisce. But I'm not going to do that. I want to take you back to the era where we in our old location were beginning to ask God what we should do. 
there are two stories, two miracles, and that's all we'll look at today. And the first one, instead of me just standing on stage and telling you about it, I sort of want to take you back to where we were so that you can visualize. So with your permission, I'm just going to sit down here, and if you will, watch this video. Wow, feels really nostalgic here. 39 years ago next month, Mary Alice and I, Jonathan and Jared, moved to Wichita. This was our first house. It was the parsonage that went with the church. We actually lived here for seven years. A lot of great memories. I can think about teaching the boys to ride their bicycles in the parking lot here. And we were just really getting acquainted with Wichita and getting acquainted with the church. But those were wonderful years. and and. As I look back on the time that we spent here together, it was like God was building a foundation, not just building a foundation in our hearts, but also building a foundation in the future leaders that were going to be, even now, a great part of everything that God is doing at New Spring. So for just a few moments, I kind of want you to kind of take a journey with us to see how God led us in these days and how he began to lay the foundations of what we know of as New Spring Church. It's really something to be back in here. This is the worship center that we had. And I think as I stand here, I think I preached probably around 2000 sermons in this place. So it's very special to me and it still has a place in my heart. But we were beginning to grow in the, well, in the very early 90s, to the end of the 80s, certainly not by how we would think about growth at New Spring today. I never will forget when we reached about 400 in attendance and it was in that season that Mary Alice and I and Jonathan and Jared had gone to Texas and we wound up driving back uh, to the campus and also we lived, as you know, across the parking lot. I was driving, we were driving back about two o'clock in the morning and it was as if the Holy Spirit said to me, within 10 years, you need to be moved. And I had this sense that God was gonna do something great in our church and, and if you look around in this building, it was just too small to, to handle, to hold. We only have about 4.3 acres on this campus. So when God had spoken to me about that, I knew we needed to relocate. But in those days, almost nobody wanted to relocate. In fact, nobody would even talk about it. It was, it, it, I, I was really scared to even broach the subject of relocation. But Mary Alice knew, and, and I was looking for land around the city. All those parcels would have been the wrong parcels today. But like around 1990, 1991, I was looking for land. But in the early 90s, we were, we were growing. Uh, I remember growing from 400 to 500 and 500 to 550. And the challenge was in those days that we were really getting tied in here. Uh, you can't tell it right now, but we put in extra pews against the back wall and, and more pews up here in the front. We started leaving the choir up and the orchestra up. And I remember we built, a, a, little, uh, a, a little protrusion here where I could step out and preach. So we were growing a lot and, and I knew in my heart we needed to relocate, but I also knew there was no way in the world that our people in those days, or definitely the large majority of our people would wanna move. So, you know, uh, sometimes we can begin to start thinking about, we can do half of what God wants us to do. I knew in my heart that he wanted us to relocate but at the same time, because I couldn't really get a lot of people to see that, I just thought, okay, we've got to come up with some other plan that allows for growth, but at the same time, doesn't scare everyone with relocation. And so we came up with the idea that was acceptable in those days, that we would, uh, we would build another building outside that would allow for some growth. And in my mind, the calculus worked like this. If we allow for some growth, um, eventually we'll grow to the place where we'll be large enough to relocate. Well, that started a whole lot of things that could have gone wrong in a huge way. We'll walk outside here for a moment because I kind of want to show you what we were up against. You know how sometimes 
perspective and looking back on things can tell you just how crazy something that sounded like a good idea was. Well, uh, the idea was, of course, we're gonna build a building here and we'll grow. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking that'll allow for growth and ultimately we'll be able to relocate. Well, in those days, we were already having a hard time finding places to park. In fact, I used to joke that we were parking in Northern Oklahoma. There were even businesses around that we were having to use for parking. But here's the smart idea that we had. Our idea was we're gonna take up 25% of our parking here to build this building that's supposed to allow us to have growth. But like I say at the time, it felt like the only thing that we could do. And so we had selected an architect. Uh, we had started having meetings with leadership. And I need to let you know that in that time, God began to do another miracle that is still bearing fruit yet today. We had a young man in our church. He and his wife had just come recently. And we found out that he had a background in building. In fact, he was the CEO of a very fine company that built residential and also commercial space. And they had just come to our church. And so even though we had a building committee, I asked him if he would sit in on that committee and give us advice for how we should build this building. And so typical of him, if we asked him a question, he would answer the question, but he didn't really speak to whether he thought it was a good idea or not. Well, I never will forget, we were at the end of a meeting one day and um, actually it was about 1130 at night. And I got up my courage to tell him what was really my vision and to ask him a question. By the way, his name is Billy Poor. He is our executive pastor today. And I can't even begin to say what a difference that he made. But I didn't know that at the time. We just barely knew each other. There was a big rock out there right in front of the front door. All the other building committee members had gone home. It was just Billy and me standing out there at about 1130. And I got up my courage and I said, sometimes I wonder if we should build this building. I'd never said that to anybody else. And he said, I don't think we should put another stick here. For the first time, there was really somebody I could talk to and talk about what God's plan was for us. But even then, you know, I'd love to tell you that we changed course, but I just didn't have the courage to do that. So we were still going down the line of how we were gonna build this building. And, and the idea was that it would be trial level and one of the levels would be underground. And we went to meeting after meeting after meeting with the architect. About this time, I had to go to Washington, D.C. to do a conference. I remember it well because it was the week that Stephen was born. And with me on the trip was our senior administrator, Pastor Dan Kubish, although he wasn't officially on staff yet, Jess Looper, who is now a missionary, and then my son, Jonathan, who I think was about 11 at the time. And it was a great conference. We had a great time, but it was the last night of the conference. And we were eating dinner with a staff member a worship pastor who had actually been from Wichita. And so he asked us, how's the idea for the building coming? And I said, well, and I gave him the plan, you know, we, we're gonna build this building and it's going to allow us for growth. And then ultimately we'll be able to relocate. And it was at that moment that he looked at me, put his finger in my face and he said, if you build that building, you will never be able to move. I don't even know that he knew what he was saying but it was as if the Holy Spirit of God had said that to me. If you build that building, you will never be able to move. Remember how I knew that God was leading us within 10 years to be relocated. Well, it just, I, I gotta tell you what, I, I just fell apart inside and I didn't know what to do because see, not only now, had I not ever talked about relocating, I had gone out on point and told our church, we need to build this great building. That night, I remember so clearly went back to the Hampton Inn where we were staying. And Jonathan was with me in the room. And I said, son, let's pray. Let's get on our knees and pray. And I remember on my knees praying against that bed and saying, oh God, we're about to do the wrong thing. And I don't know how to stop it. I said, God, if you don't stop this, we're gonna do the wrong thing and we're gonna lose our destiny. Well, we flew home that day. And I remember when we got to the airport, I said to Mary Alice what I always said. I said, I wanna go by the office and get my mail. Now I gotta tell you, Stephen had been born the week before. And since that time, I'd done a conference in Tulsa and I turned right around and went, did a conference in Washington, DC. And Mary Alice said, please, Mark, 
you just need to go home and rest. And I said, this time I wanna go by the office and get my mail. Well, I got right over here. If you can see where that Honda is parked right there, I had just pulled my Suburban into that and got out. I was gonna go into the office and get my mail when I looked on the sidewalk and there was our architect. Now, you know what? This may not sound like a great miracle, but I promise you, it was the miracle that just sort of started everything happening. Let me tell you what he said. He looked at me with a sad hangdog look and he said to me, I have some really bad news for you, Pastor. We are not gonna be able to build that building. And I said, why not? He said, well, I should have done bore samples, but we've got water at 12 feet and there's no way we can build that building. I know that man had to think I had lost my mind because I smiled a big smile and I said, that is not a problem at all. And it wasn't but just a few hours later that we went out with our board of officers and I told them on a piece of land in the northeast part of Wichita what God had done and what God's plan for us was. And for the first time, we were on a journey to move and relocate, to live out God's vision for us, which ultimately we know today, 25 years later, is New Spring Church. How many of you have discovered that sometimes God's greatest leadership is when he says no? It sure was in my case, in our case. Well, that piece of land that I asked the board to meet me at, and by the way, that was a strange thing too because I'd just flown back from D.C. that morning and uh, had that encounter with our architect probably around 11 o'clock. And I asked Dan, I said, would you just call all the members of our board and ask them to meet me? And we met on a piece of property, not the piece that we ultimately are on. But I think, I think those <clears throat> poor officers had to think, what in the world is Mark asking us to do? And it was a crazy thing, it was a bold thing, but when the Holy Spirit is moving and you know he's moving, you just do bold things. I met with our board that night and I said, man, this is what's happened. And for the first time, I still remember our trustees and deacons walking around in that field and saying, you know what? I think I could see God doing something like this. So from that point on, we were looking for land. I need to go back in time a little bit. The story I just described is in April of 1994. But as I said in the video, I really started looking for land in the early 90s. And most of the places that I looked at would have been wrong because Wichita has expanded since those times and, and they would have been open then, but now they'd be pretty congested. Not that we're not pretty congested anymore. <laughs> but um, I had something happen. I, th I, I don't recall, I'm getting a little older. Um, I, I don't remember if it's 91 or 92, but. I, out here in those days, about the only thing that was here was Lakeview uh, Funeral Home and Cemetery. So I had to come out here a lot and do funerals. And, and in those days, I used to joke. We were on South Hillside then. And I would say, whenever I have a funeral at Lakeview, I have to just get up on 13th Street and drive forever. And I used to joke about, I may as well take my lunch because it took a long time to drive out there. But I was crossing the bridge at 13th and uh, right before I got to Lakeview and I looked down on the ground, I saw a big concrete pipe and asked a friend in city planning, what's going on out there by Lakeview? Now, this is just my own personal take. I'm, I'm not from Wichita. I'm from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. My first church was Houston. So I'm accustomed to big cities, and I'm accustomed to quick and fast development. When I moved here, it felt like to me Wichita was pretty static because we were built pretty much on a cross, I-135 and, and, and uh, 54. And then there was an expressway that kind of belted the southwest part of the city, and then there was an expressway that belted the northwest. But to my thinking, most of the real estate had been messed up on the northwest side because of the big ditch. So I, I thought that's kind of what the city was like when I moved here. But when I asked my friend what's going to happen out there by 13th, he said, oh, Pastor, there's going to be an expressway that's going to belt the northeast quadrant of the city. Now, I, I, I just don't know. I mean, those, the, when I get to heaven, I'll find out a lot of things about how that things happen. But in my mind, I felt like God told me right then, that's where you need to be. Well, now we're looking for land, and, and everyone's kind of on board that, yeah, we probably do need to relocate. So the question is, how much land do we need? And we did bring in one expert. He didn't do us a whole lot of good. You know, all you have to do to be an expert is carry a leather briefcase and go 300 miles away from town. That's all you need. <laughs> so he really didn't give us a lot of insight. But he did give us one valuable piece. He said, given where you are as a church and your size and your growth potential, he said, you need between 15 and 25 acres. Okay, that's how much we need, 15 to 25 acres. To me, 15 acres sounds like... That'd be great. We'd never need more. So we start looking for land. Now, there's something that you should know, and some of you, if you're in commercial real estate or if you've been involved in development on this northeast side, you may know this already. 
But in the early days of K96, by the way, it, it, at first it stopped at Rock Road. So I think when I started looking, it, it was still stopped at Rock. And then it, little by little, they built it all the way around uh, to Kellogg. So uh, <laughs> from 13th Street South, there were not service. There was not sewer. And then from 13th Street North, there were full city services. So it was priced like this. 13th Street and South, it was priced by the acre. 13th Street and North was priced by the square foot. Now, I was born at night, but not last night. Now, I'm not an expert in commercial real estate. I just knew when they started pricing it by the square foot, I was out. I was out of the game. So we only just started looking south of 13th Street. And there was a parcel of land that it would, it would not have been perfect. We would have had to come up with some kind of solution for the sewer issue. But the owners of the land said, yeah, we'll sell you the land. And, and so what I did in those days, I went to the board. And I, in those days, I negotiated for everything. It was just kind of my responsibility. And one of the things that I would ask the board to do is I would ask them to set a cap for whatever I was going to buy, whether it was a van for the church or whatever. I just asked the guys to set a cap because that's a very powerful negotiating tool. Can't is the most powerful word in negotiation. You can tell me I should pay something, but if I can't, so uh, I asked the guys, we had, we had paid off the entire campus. We'd been debt free for a long time. I mean, we had a million dollars in the bank. So what I wanted to do is I wanted, my, I wanted to target spending $300,000 for the land, keep back $700,000 to start construction. But I knew that where we wanted to be, that was insane because there was no way you could buy land for that kind of money. But in any event, the uh, owners of the land that was South 13th Street, they said, yeah, we'll, we'll save the land. There's only one hitch. Uh, there's someone who has an option on this land, and we don't think they're going to be able to. We don't, we don't think they're going to be able to exercise it. Uh, and so we'll sell you the land for this price. As soon as that option expires, we'll sell it to you. Well, I think it was um, I want to say 120 days. And it had to wait, but I just felt like, hey, they told us we're going to do the deal with you. And then they said, oh, well, there's 30 more days. So now it's like 150 days. This, you, you realize now we're, we're into pretty well half a year. But we came, we're coming to the end of that, and I had to get on a plane and uh, fly to uh, Tennessee to do a conference for a Jewish organization. And uh, when I was getting on a plane, our executive pastor, who's not, I mean, he was like, he was just, and that, by that time, Billy's on our board. He's not a staff member yet, and still, still building uh, wonderful homes. Billy said, uh, Pastor, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get the land next week. And he said, I'll have my heavy equipment out there. It was spring. He said, I'll have my heavy equipment out there as soon as we get it, and we'll have a sunrise service on the new location. So when I get on a plane to fly to Tennessee, that is what is on my mind. I'm sketching out ideas for a sunrise service. I speak on Friday night, downtown Chattanooga. Next morning, I'm back at my hotel getting ready to fly out, and I get a call from Billy, and Billy said, Pastor, I've never had secrets from you. I've got some really bad news. He said, the people that had the option exercise the option, and we don't have any land. And I just really bounced. I hit hard. You know, I was just so upset. And most of you will not know this name, but in those days, I had a mentor and a close friend who spoke for us often in those days. His name was Don Sisk. And he happened to be president of a very large missionary organization in Chattanooga. And I don't know how he knows about the, knew about this. I suspicion Mary Alice called him. So I get this knock on my door at my hotel room. And he's out there and he says, Mark, I heard about what happened to you. He said, I just want you to know that God has something better for you. And I said, I don't want something better. I want that piece of land. <laughs> well, I came home and we were just devastated. We were like starting from square one and didn't know where to go. And, but we still have that $300,000 cap saying that the board agreed to. And in those days, we would drive down 21st Street, and we would watch this parcel of land, and Mary Alice would say this to me, Mark, what about that land? I said, well, it is the best piece of land on K96, but you don't know anything about real estate. <laughs> I said two things. I said, number one, it's not for sale, and number two, if it was, it would be in the millions. And she said, well, you know. And Mary also said this. She's just a great prayer warrior. She always says, it doesn't hurt to ask God. <laughs> Elohim. <laughs> oh, I would just love to tell you that that just started me off on a faith journey. It did, and I didn't change anything. <laughs> one Sunday morning, I was in the old location. I was in the hallway, and there was a businessman here. He's a member of one of these like, local civic organizations like K96. 
Kiwanis or something like that. And he, uh, in this organization, had met a wonderful Christian man who handled the investments, uh, land investments, for the owner that owned this property. He, the, the owner lived in a different city, but this Christian gentleman, he was a member of a Baptist church here, fine Christian man, handled the investments. And so uh, this man who had been at this meeting gave me his name, and I called him, and I said, well, you know, I'm really kind of interested, and in, we want to buy land, and that land out there at 96 and 21st Street, I, I really like that, and I said, I know it's not for sale, and he said, well, you know, tell me what you have in mind, and, and I'll uh, talk to the owner. So, okay, now here's, here's my calculus. I'm thinking, how much land do I need? I need 15 to 25 acres. How much, what's my cap? $300,000. Now, I know that's ridiculous. I mean, I'm, I'm prepared if we have to to pay the entire million plus going out and borrowing a couple other million. And even that, I know, would not put me in the game. But I don't have that option because we have a, we have a cap. So here's what I said to him. I said, you tell him we'll pay. I want the corner. Because in the old days, at the old location, people used to come to our church and say, you guys are the best kept secret in the city. And I'm like, I don't want to be a secret anymore. So I said, okay, here, here, here's what we'll do. We'll pay $10,000 an acre for 25 acres. Now, instantly, I know I can go down to 15. I can go up to 300. And that's just for starting talking. So I said, tell him 25 acres for $10,000 an acre. And he said, okay, I'll present that offer. And so he talked to the owner and came back and told me the owner will sell you 25 acres on the corner of K96 and 21st Street for $10,000 an acre for 25 acres. Wow. Man, I'm, I'm claiming miracles. I'm, this is the Red Sea kind of miracle. And I'm so excited. Well, the, the agent said, here's what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to bring contract over to you. You'll sign your side of the contract. I'll take it up. He lives in another city. I'll take it up to the owner. He'll sign his side of the city, uh, side of the contract. But, but here's the thing. And for all of you who were around K96 in 1994, you know that it's a highway with nothing on it. And, but everybody knows this is going to be big, especially this part. And so people were waiting for somebody to blink and set a price. And when the word got out on the street that this corner was being negotiated for, it got hot and heavy. Now, this is in between when I signed my side of the contract and when they took it up to the owner. And all of a sudden, all these offers started pouring in to the owner in the millions. And I got a call from the agent, and he said, Pastor, you know what's happening. And he said, I've talked to the owners, and they're not going to do the deal with you. I can still see this moment like yesterday. <laughs> I had this, I inherited this big ostentatious office, which I hate those kinds of things. Huge desk, big tall chair. I didn't even sit in that chair, it drove me nuts. I went over to the nursery and got a rocking chair, put it by the corner of my desk, <laughs> put my phone there where I could work like a real human. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I tell the agent, I want the phone number of that owner because I've never talked to him. And I have, and I hate, to, I hate for you to hear this about your pastor. I have every intention of telling him what a dirty dog I thought he was for reneging on a verbal contract, <laughs> even though I knew it didn't make any sense. So he gave me the number. And I've got the, I've got the receiver of the phone in my hand and I'm just about to dial when all of a sudden, and I haven't had this happen. I, t I told this story in a series I did, I think in 2015 called Divine Whispers. I haven't had the Holy Spirit speak so loudly to me, not audibly, but I've, never, I've, I've probably had about five or six times in my life where I felt like the Holy Spirit just, I, if he had spoken out loud, it wouldn't have been as strong. It was like the Spirit of God put his hand in my chest and said, Mark, that is not the way to handle this. I hate it when he does that. <laughs> I had the phone in my hand. I'm dialing the number. You know what? If you don't have faith, just act like you have it. That is faith. I dialed the number. The man's voice comes on the other line. Never talked to him before. I called him by name. And I said to him, Mr. My name is Mark Hoover. I pastor the church that tried to buy your land. And I said, there's something you should know. I'm not going to go out there and build a mall. I knew some of the people who were throwing offers out. I'm not going to go out there and build a mall. I'm not going to go out there and build a factory. I want us to go out and build a church. Now, if God wants one of those other entities to have the land, I want them to have it. That wasn't strictly true. I'm just trying to... 
If I didn't have faith, I was going to talk like I had faith. <laughs> but I said, if God wants us to have it, I want us to have it. I called him my name again, and I said, there's only one thing you should know. All I care about is that God gets the glory. I didn't know who I was talking to, total stranger. Phone conversation probably lasted a minute. He thanked me politely. I hung up the phone, and as God is my witness, I thought, we've lost our land, but we've kept our testimony. <laughs> <sighs> Y'all are too young to remember this. In those days, we used to have our car phones installed in our, on a pedestal in our car. So it's Friday afternoon, and I'm going to Derby to make a visit. You remember, we're located on South Central in those days. And my phone rings. And I pick up the receiver, and it's this agent that I talked to before about the land. I never expected to hear from him again. And he said to me, Pastor, he said, I just got off the phone with Mr. I got off the phone with the owner. And uh, he said, he really likes you. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm a likable guy. <laughs> That's what I said to him. I mean, what else did you say? <laughs> he really likes you. Good. He said, no, <laughs> he said, I've handled, I've handled his investments 25 years. I'm not even sure he likes me. <laughs> but he said, he really likes you. We were a Baptist church in those days. He said, that Baptist pastor is the nicest guy I ever talked to. He said, it's up to you, preacher. But he said, if I were you, I'd make that man an offer. Well, what can I do? I'm driving. I got a $300,000 cap. I've already offered $10,000 an acre, and I'm just about to tell him we'll pay $10,000 an acre for 30 acres. See if I can negotiate and see if we get down to 25 or 15. But before I could get those words out of my mouth, he said something that just destroyed my balloon. He said, the only thing is he doesn't want to mess up his quarter section. Now, for all of us here today, watch how brilliant the Holy Spirit is. He doesn't want to mess up his quarter section. The minimum he'll sell you is 40 acres. Oh, we understand that now. I didn't understand it then because now I got real trouble. I've already offered him $10,000 an acre and, he wanted, and, 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 and the offer is going to have to be something that fits that $300,000. Now I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to give him something and I'll, run, I'll, I'll ask the board to come together tonight. We'll give him the whole million dollars. We'll borrow money to get this piece of land. But I can't do it then. Got a real cap. So I said to him, okay, here's the deal. We'll pay you, <laughs> we'll you $10,000 an acre for 30 acres, and I want him to give us the other 10. <laughs> That's what he did. <laughs> he said, preacher, that, that's crazy. He said, you know what's being offered. I said, yeah, I do, but that's all I can do right now. He said, well, I'm bound by law to present any offer. That's Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock. Eleven forty-five on Saturday night, my phone rings. You know, in a preacher's home, when somebody when the phone rings at eleven forty-five, it's not good news. But this time it was. I answered the phone, and the agent was crying so hard he could barely choke it out. He said, "I'm sitting here," and he named the couple. And I've got a signed contract for 30 acres at $10,000 an acre, and they're going to give you the other 10. <laughs> well, you guys know I have an anxiety disorder. It takes 45 days to get the EPA study and title search. And I'm chewing my fingernails down, down to my elbows. And <laughs> I'm just waiting for something to go wrong. Somebody to change their mind. But finally, the day for closing came and we went to the title office and the title agent is sitting to my left and I've got several people from New Spring. I've got Dan Kubish, I think, was there. One of our board members and then my son, Jared. And waiting for the couple to come in, and they come in. And again, you guys are all too young to even know what I'm talking about. It's what old people do. They tell old stories that nobody understands. But if any of you who remember Buddy Epson, uh, 
when I was a small child, he was on a show called The Beverly Hillbillies. But what a lot of people don't know is he was on a detective show later called Barnaby Jones for even longer. And so when this couple comes in, this guy's older. Now, to me, I'm 30, I'm 35 years old. Everybody looks older to me then. He's probably younger than I am now. He walks in with his wife. They're very nicely attired, have a leather briefcase, sat on the other side. We just said pretty well, hello. And that's it. It's very professional. It's very, very ordered. And so he starts with this big sheet of paper. If you've ever bought commercial real estate, he, he's sitting here with this big sheet of uh, this big stack of papers. And, and so one by one, he signs and then passes the title agent. She finds, passes to me. I sign. I did not have the courage to ask this question until all the papers were in my stack. <laughs> and the land was ours. And I looked down and I called him by name. And again, you realize I only had like a 60 second conversation with him. And I've said hello to him. I called him by name and I said, I have to ask you a question. Why did you do this deal with us? Why didn't you take one of those other offers? And I really believe that I'll remember this until my dying day. It was at that moment that he raised his hands to heaven. And he said, I tried to take those other offers but every time I tried to take one of those offers, all I could hear was Mark's voice saying, all I care about is that God gets the glory. <laughs> Jehovah, Jireh. At the moment of our extremity, God provides. Do you understand for all of you who are new to New Spring, let's just say even in the last 20, 25 years, do you understand this is not a man-made ministry? It is not a ministry that's been built on some kind of formula. It has been a ministry where our God Almighty has stepped in and Jehovah Jireh has done miracle after miracle after miracle and he's still doing miracles even in 2024. <laughs> And it's rare for me to take a Sunday because, or Saturday and Sunday, a weekend. It's very rare for me to do something like this because we're talking about things that will change your life. But I'm not as young as I used to be. I hope the Lord gives me many more years here. But I just know for all who take the baton someday and go forward, I want you to understand what this ministry is like. There is no secret sauce here. There is no secret formula. It's loving God and loving people and staying faithful to God's word and trusting the Holy Spirit and not being afraid and not being cowardly. You see, every mistake, people have asked me through the years, I mean, in, in all my years of pastoring, Mark, what are your biggest mistakes? My biggest mistakes were stopping short of what God had for us. Most of us, we live as though our God is way smaller than he really is. I hear people every once in a while say, Mark, I hate to burden God with this. Do you realize you're talking to Elohim? There is nothing in your life, there is no problem you have that is a burden for God. You know, trying to get your lawnmower to run 30 miles an hour is not easy. <laughs> but if you have a Lamborghini, 30 miles an hour is not a challenge. You know, I go back to where I started and it's time to end. I go back to where I started. We talked about Abraham. And we talked about how that God called him out to the mountain to go through the motions of what God would someday have to do. And you know and I know there was another mountain called Calvary. And this time, the father didn't have a lamb for a sacrifice because the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. See, God came into our world took on a human body so that he could run the table for us, live the life that we can't live, and then turn right back around and be willing to sacrifice his life as though he were guilty of all our sins. And when God looked at what Jesus did, God said, paid in full, paid in full. And even right now, no matter who you are, whether you're in one of our auditoriums or you're watching online or watching on television, wherever you are, 
If you've never invited Jesus Christ to come into your life, and if you've never felt that full pardon and that forgiveness and that freedom and, and the release from all of our failures and sins, if you've never felt that, you can experience that today. And Jehovah Jireh will hear your prayer and provide you with everlasting life, forgiveness of sin, adoption into God's family. And on top of that, there's something called sanctification. I know that sounds like an old term, but what it simply means is God is going to work in your life every day to make you more like Jesus. And he'll just keep working with you and he won't give up with you. He won't give up on you. He'll just keep working until you're in the presence of Jesus and you're fully perfect like him. What an awesome God. And to have that as a gift, you, you can't get it with religion. I, you know how I feel about New Spring Church, but New Spring Church can't even give this to you. Only God. So it's a gift, and, and the only way to receive a gift is just to reach out and accept it. So I'm going to do something. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So calls, that's asks. I'm going to lead you in a prayer that calls. You don't have to say these words. You can say your own if you like, but these are words that work if you mean them. That's the important thing. Saying them by, won't, won't do it, but just meaning them from your heart will. So let's pray together. Would you bow your head with me, please? Dear God. I know I'm a sinner, but I believe you love me very much. I believe Jesus died to pay for my sins. I believe he arose from the grave. And since Jesus is alive, I want him to be my savior and my king. I don't want to go down the road I'm on anymore. I want to get off this road. I want to follow Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, have a gift I want to give you for watching online or television, just text. By the way, there's a New Spring Bible just like this one, a book I wrote called My New Walk with God. Just text PRAY, P-R-A-Y-E-D to 97,000, follow the steps. If you're here, you don't have to wait. You can go to any info center and say, I pray with Mark and take this home with you today. God bless. Thanks for being here.